Welcome to the Growth Cap Podcast, where we chat with CEOs, investors, and other key industry leaders to uncover insights and strategies for accelerating growth and succeeding in business. I'm your host, RJ Lumba. In this episode, we chat with Jan Ahrens, a former corporate software professional turned entrepreneur. Unlike many of today's startup founders, Jan took a more methodical approach to founding and ultimately building his company, Saligo. Saligo simplifies the integration of business applications and data sources in the enterprise. Its integration platform as a service, or iPaaS solution, allows both technical and business users to connect applications together quickly through an industry-leading guided user interface. Based in San Mateo, California, Saligo is backed by growth equity. In setting out as a software entrepreneur, Jan first identified a distinct need in the market through his client engagements as an IT services provider. He then began gradually transitioning to developing a software product while ensuring a true product market fit. As we hear from Jan, building a company is not easy, but with passion and a single-minded focus, one can overcome the inevitable challenges which accompany the entrepreneurial journey. We hope you enjoy the show. So Jan, thank you so much for taking the time. Really excited to to chat with you. So maybe what we could do is start off with a little bit of your background as well as hear about Saligo and then we'll uh, we'll chat from there. Sounds good. Uh, thanks for having me on. Jan Renz in terms of personal background. I got started in computer science. I think it was more for one of those forced degrees where it seemed convenient, so I did it. And then first couple of years out of college, took advantage of my degree, was a developer, doing some technical stuff, and then fairly quickly, I suspected, found out that that was not really my calling. And, and I think where the, the space I occupied for, well, let's say, the first 10 years of my career was really around that techno business arena where I knew enough about technology and was technical enough to be able to get on the business side and use that to my advantage. So uh, I joined a company called Cambridge Technology Partners, pretty well-known consulting firm back in the, in the late 90s, really cut my teeth there, and then ultimately ended up at a small startup called NetSuite back in 2003. There were about 180 people at that time. And that was my intro to SaaS, and that really changed my entire perspective and and opened my eyes in terms of what the future might hold. And so I spent three years there, really three great years in terms of just learning, understanding the business, doing multiple different things, being a product manager, leading a, a small professional services team, so on and so forth. And that ultimately was the impetus for me to start Sligo. So that's kind of a quick intro into my background. Oh, great. You know, it's interesting because you've, you made the jump from, you know, working in uh, more of a corporate setting and playing a, you know, a certain role and you made the jump to founder. I'm sure there's, you know, tens of thousands of people in the tech arena and working for software companies that probably, you know, have, you know, deep down inside the desire to make the jump. Can you tell us a little bit about that, your thought process at the time? Yeah, and I've had this conversation with others as well. I think there are a lot of people who deep down, as you said, want to start something. And I think out of those folks, there's a subset where they know for sure it's something likely they're going to do. And I certainly fell in, in that category. I was restless. I knew this is something, this meaning starting a business is something that I really wanted to do. And I was going to do it no matter what. And ultimately, it was a case of finding the right business model and the right opportunity. So I was I was very sure. And, and as I said, just waiting, biding my time until the right thing came along. And then, of course, once I joined NetSuite, within three to six months, immediately it became clear as to what I wanted to do. I would say to those listening, if you're very sure you have a certain conviction that this is what you want to do, then go find the right business model. Just do it. And if you're not sure, then definitely think about the pros and cons. Talk to other founders. It's never easy, but if 
if it's something that you're passionate about, uh, you should definitely do it. And it looks like there was a little bit of a break between when you left in NetSuite and when you started, you know, Saligo. In that interim time, was that kind of the beginnings of your entrepreneurial journey, or you know, were you kind of engaging on on other things at the time? Yeah, no, uh, it's easy to explain. So right after leaving NetSuite, that was end of 2005, I started a consulting firm that grew to about 30, 30, 40 people. We did consulting work around the the largest SaaS ecosystems, such as Salesforce, NetSuite, doing everything from business process consulting to implementation of those software apps, so on and so forth, but with a particular bent towards integration and building integrations on behalf of our customers and frankly, building maybe the early version of the IP that ultimately Saligo was formed on. So we did that from 2006 through the end of 2010. Those were some transformational years in the SaaS space, like lots of new SaaS companies coming around and then how companies use SaaS started to change as well. And coming out of that, our integration business was really starting to take off. And we decided that it made sense to go ahead and start to go the SaaS companies. This was early in 2011. We still held on to the consulting business as a separate line of business, which ultimately helped pay some of the bills when we got started, which is what allowed us to really bootstrap Saligo from 2011 all the way until the end of 2015 before we raised our Series A round. So that's how we got started. It's not a typical Silicon Valley story, even though we're in the heart of Silicon Valley, we took a, a path less traveled. Yeah, I know it's it's really interesting because the uh, uh, podcast we we just did it hasn't been launched yet, but we did a podcast with with uh, Sana Commerce, and they have a very similar story in, in which they were an IT services company, and then spun out their product over twelve years ago, and since then they've been growing at a fifty percent rate. So they were bootstrapped, still bootstrapped, all the way to four hundred people. So it, it's what I found is, and, and this is not uncommon, right, for those who have you know, been around, you know, the block is that IT services companies oftentimes have a firsthand look into what the market needs, uh, what the market really needs and how to kind of hone in on productizing the service. So, you know, kudos to, you know, yeah, to what you were able to do. If I can just add to that point, that's, it was not by accident. It, that was precisely why I chose that path. And of course, looking back, you can always look back and second guess with the benefit of hindsight. But I'm glad that we took the path we did, mainly because we wanted to go learn the space. We, I knew that the, the Sligo business was ultimately what I wanted to do. I was fairly sure. But we took a, a different path to get there and, of course, learned a ton. While it's easy in a, in a consulting business to just make money, right? You don't have to go raise capital. So so that was, uh, again, a different path. But uh, I think, in my opinion, well worth it. Yeah, maybe what we'll do is we'll switch gears here to talk more about exactly what the company does. but then And then I'd like to, to head into how you made the decision to actually bring in outside capital. Because I know that that is a big decision, giving up you know, some ownership in the business. But yeah, let, can, can we dive a little bit deeper into kind of, you know, what Saligo does for, for the benefit of our audience? Sure. So Saligo is an integration company. And what we do is we help companies automate some of their business processes, internal business processes in the enterprise by giving them the ability to connect various disparate business applications together. So for example, Let's take a business process like uh, quote to cash. If you're selling to other businesses, clearly you have to have a sales force that's engaged in a sales cycle. They have to send out a proposal. Once they close the deal, they have to close the order. Uh, and then ultimately it has to get into the back office, right? So this might touch a CRM, an ERP, a billing application, a CPQ, electronic signature, multiple disparate apps. 
And that's a great example of fairly well-known business process that's splintered across multiple business applications. And ultimately, you have to connect those various disparate apps together to be able to automate that business process. And that's what we do. We provide a platform. We like to target the mid-market. And through this platform, companies, both IT teams and what we call more tech-savvy business users can go ahead and implement some of these automations, build out some of these integration flows, or deploy some other well-known pre-built integrations between uh, well-known applications. So again, in, in the quote to cash business process example, you might be connecting the, the CRM with the ERP. It might be a Salesforce and a NetSuite. And we have a pre-built integration that's pretty much shrink-wrapped to be able to be deployed. And that can be done by business users as well. So that's essentially the business problem that we solve. And you know, you've, you've been able to kind of you know, scale and, and bootstrap along the way, partially because you started out you know, as an IT services business, which was throwing off cash flow. And then for a number of years, you were able to scale, but then eventually decided to take on capital. What, what made you decide to bring in a partner? Uh, yeah, so trying to use a small consulting business that was run as a separate line of business to fund a software company is always going to be a means to it an end. And I say always a little bit loosely because depending on the model, perhaps you can succeed in and not have to raise capital. But we knew it was just a matter of time. And once we got to a certain scale in terms of revenue and, and headcount, and it was clear the only thing that was going to hold us back was the lack of an investment to really build the business out, whether that was R&D, sales and marketing, so on and so forth, then it just becomes inevitable. So a fairly predictable path, I would say, in the end, perhaps took a slightly longer than expected for us to pull the trigger on it, because clearly to go raise money while you're running a business is always time consuming. We were a little thin on the top at that time, but that's what we ended up doing. And you have a, a couple good, you know, partners now. You know, how has it, I guess, changed? You know, the way you you look at the business and and how you approach growing it, or or or, or has it changed? You know, kind of your your vision. Yeah. So first off, I was pretty selective in terms of the venture partners that we would bring in to the business uh, after bootstrapping the company and not raising seed money or not raising a Series A at an early stage. I wanted to make sure that the the partners, the investors we bring in were pretty well aligned. So I'm very happy with the investors that we have right now. It's worked out really, really well. And in terms of mindset, look, if you were to fast forward to today, even though we've taken somewhat of a different path to get here. Ultimately, now we are, I would say, a fairly typical Series B company. And what would set us somewhat apart is in our DNA, we are not, we're not just going to go massively spend money for no reason. We want to throw money at a problem that we think there's going to be a return on. So we are fairly still efficient when it comes to deploying cash, but we're coming to a point where it things are going really well. Clearly, there's a pandemic out there, but given that companies now, more than ever, want to accelerate their transformation, digital transformation, then picking a, an integration vendor, an iPath, which is the, the space we're in, becomes really important. And we've gotten a tremendous tailwind from the pandemic. And so we're getting to the point where we can grow in so many different directions. And we are contemplating as to how we think about raising capital down the road as well. So yeah, it, uh, I, I think the point I'm trying to make is that ultimately we've landed pretty much where most other companies land once they get to the stage. And what has been the most kind of challenging aspect to 
kind of becoming an entrepreneur, a successful entrepreneur that's able to scale a business? Were, were there kind of things that you didn't really foresee, you know, as you were embarking on this journey where, you know, you, you found yourself having to think through certain, you know, situations, you know, that, that, that you didn't anticipate, but then in the end was kind of critical to, to becoming good at. Right. So uh, it's, it's some of the classic things like establishing product market fit or thinking you have it, but then perhaps realizing that was not exactly what you had in mind and having to refine it. So I think that's something in the early stages that we, there was some going back and forth. Uh, and, and ultimately in a space like ours, as I said before, you can grow in so many different ways. It's being decisive in how, where you want to grow from a go-to-market standpoint. Do you want to go after verticals? Do you want to go after certain business processes? Do you want to focus on certain SaaS ecosystems? Do you want to do OEM sales versus sell to end customers, right? Just, just to name a, a few different vectors and these are all things that it's easy to get overwhelmed. It's easy also to make quick decisions and then if you don't get it right, not backtrack. So I, I think there's been, again, some trial and error when it comes to go to market, which is to be expected. But I would think the, the biggest component for me is just hiring and having the right team. It's just amazing what you can do once you have the right team in place. And that, I think if I were to look back and if there's one thing I would change, if I were to take everything that I know today and go back to 2015, for example, I think I would perhaps hire a little bit differently. Just a along that vein, how, how do you, how do you hire today? I mean, how, you know, how do you determine who's going to be, you know, the right person for the role? Right. So I am responsible, at least personally, in either making my uh, hiring my direct reports or working with my other leaders to bring in management level resources. So I, I think it really comes down to truly understanding for staff what we're trying to do and what the qualifications or the profile of the candidate that we're hiring. I know that sounds simple, but oftentimes it, it's a detail that gets overlooked, right? Really matching those, coming up with the ideal candidate profile, and then really defining the right interview process. It is something that I've spent a fair bit of time on. I'm right now hiring a couple of senior resources at the senior leadership level, and I think the process we're running is, is far better than before. And uh, you mentioned earlier that you knew that you really wanted to become uh, an entrepreneur and build your own business. Was there someone kind of that early on that helped kind of, you know, shine a light on, on, on that path? Someone you kind of admire either, you know, professionally or personally? You know, there's not one particular person per se. I think if I were to look at I think it's just a combination of various different traits from various different leaders and personalities uh, from sports figures, such as uh, Michael Jordan to tech leaders to, let's say, former presidents. These are all things that have inspired me or people who have inspired me, but it really comes down to particular traits, I would say. I know we're coming up on, on time here, but maybe to close out, you know, along that line of thought, you know, are there one or two kind of key factors or, or traits that you can attribute to your ability to, to grow the business? You know, many businesses, you know, don't survive and, 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 you know, never find firm footing. And so, but you've, you've been able to do that and do, do so in a capital efficient way which requires a certain amount of, of skill. So, you know, are, are there one or two thing, you know, key things that you would attribute to your success to date? If I were to respond to that, I will say that it's the commitment and passion that I've had for running the business and the 
business problem that we solve. So it's just being very single-minded about it, being somewhat obsessive about it, understanding what we're trying to do, where we want to get to, and never really thinking about failure, but always charting a path to that destination and being so single-minded about it, I think would be the, the traits that I would put above the rest. Got it. No, I think that's super uh, insightful. It's, it's never an easy thing. I, you know, I guess in the course of my career, I've probably talked to, you know, thousands of, of CEOs and I'm always impressed with how they're able to kind of manage through and persist even during kind of turbulent times. You know, with that, you know, I really appreciate you you spending the time with us, Jan, and, and I know our audience will find this very insightful. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you inviting me.